When ships explore the wild seas of the Southern Ocean, they send down trawl nets thousands of meters into the void. Sometimes they return with what seafarers used to call monsters of the deep. For us, there was one specimen we had been waiting for, perhaps the most mysterious of nature's giants. In the tank behind me are two incredible giant squid that were caught by accident by a trawler fishing the deep ocean off New Zealand's South Island. They were frozen immediately on board and we've been thawing them out overnight. We know nothing about them, not even what sex they are, but we're about to find out. As a vet, I've encountered many strange animals, but nothing quite like this. These rare specimens brought to New Zealand's Te Papa Museum offer a fantastic opportunity to investigate a deep sea oddity. There's a huge debate out there as to what these are. For Steve O'Shea, the mysteries surrounding the giant squid have become a lifelong obsession. We really know so very little about these things. Tantalizingly, the only record of a live giant squid in the deep is this series of murky pictures taken a thousand meters down. It appears to thrash its arms about. The only video is this brief glimpse looking down from a ship as the giant squid breaks the surface. It seems to jet water as it tries to escape but these images reveal very little about their behavior. To understand how these elusive creatures live and hunt and replicate, we'll carry out a dissection. We'll also look at their more accessible living relatives, the octopus and other kinds of squid. It looks beautiful. First impressions when you look at a squid like this is it looks like a complete and utter alien. It's quite good to get your head around exactly what the major component parts of them. So if you start at the back, you've got a tail fin here. All this is a mantle. Inside here is digestive system, reproductive system and so on. Then you move forward, you've got the funnel which is involved in propulsion and locomotion. You've got eyes here, there's one of them on that side. If we pull this arm back, you can see essentially the mouth and the beak in here. And then at the front, the bit that squid are most famous for is all these arms, eight arms at the front, but then the tentacles, which are just way, way, way longer than the arms. There does seem to be a tendency for deep sea animals to get extremely large. Here, for example, is a deep sea isopod crustacean. It's like a woodlouse. It's a kind of deep sea woodlouse. It's a good illustration of the tendency for deep sea animals to get very large. We know a lot about large animals in land. We know about lions and elephants and things like that. But here are these creatures which are also very large, but because they're in the deep sea, we know almost nothing about them. They are the Martians. The first clues to the secret life of the giant squid can be found by meeting their smaller cousins. Joy Rydenberg joined Steve O'Shea and his crew to search for them off New Zealand's North Island. Now it's a full moon tonight and what we'll find is that the scattering layer, this is basically the krill or the stuff that squid are going to eat, is going to lower through the water, maybe to a depth of about 10 metres. We're going to put the, the rod, the remote operated vehicle we've got out there with all the lights on it, we're going to put that in the water and hopefully just above the scattering layer of krill and small fish, we're going to find our squid. Now that's a grand plan anyway. We're also going to throw out everything else we've got. We've got nets, we've got jigs, we've got light traps, everything we can to try and get you your squid. Squid! Joy's had plenty of experience with whales and sharks, but squid are new to her. So Steve, 
Why is one red and one white? Are these different species or the same? No, no, this is, this is all uh, the common arrow squid. This is basically what people eat. And uh, I think that one there is lighter than that one there, simply because that one's a bit more pissed off. <laughs> and they can change their color just like that. Uh, okay. Come here. I can't believe it lets you catch it so easily. Oh, yeah, fuck! Oh! Ah. Okay, it happens. It's just enough to draw blood. It's a really sharp Aww. beak. <laughs> now look at that, look at that beak go. Okay, now that, whoop, it's an evil thing that will just shred any prey that this animal comes upon, which it's then going to shove down its very narrow throat. Now, pick an arm. And if you have a look there, right up close, you see each one of those, see all those little wee teeth? Inside the... <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't do that. On, I didn't do that on purpose. It's weird because you've got smaller suckers here going into some massive suckers where Joy is now. You see, if you have a look at the club itself. That's the and business end. The business end. And <laughs> at the base of that, you've got lots of suckers on this side and lots of knobs on this. Well, they actually interdisperse knobs and suckers. Now, those two clamp together, they're held together okay. and zipped up for their length the entire time. So is this like having press studs? It's a, it's a ziplock. <laughs> so it just puts press studs it's that zip. holds them together? Yeah. So and does it, it swim around with them like this the whole time? Well, it's probably... Spread. No one knows for sure how giant squid use their tentacles to hunt. But we can get some idea by looking at what smaller squid do at this lab in Woods Hole on the east coast of America. Simon Watt's going to use a high-speed camera to see how they strike their prey. Time. Here we go. Oh, and there it goes. Oh, that was that was quick. It just shot out those two long tentacles of it and grabbed it. And this this would be a horrible way to go. Actually, you can see it's really ripping this fish apart, bite by bite. Its beak's working like this, nibbling away at that fish. The fish is still very, very much alive and it's still just shredding it at this very minute. If you can imagine scaling this up to the size of a giant squid, this would be a horrible way to go. We think being eaten alive by a shark would be awful, but this is so, so much worse. Oh, it's awful. If we play back the attack in slow motion, you can see the incredible speed that those tentacles shoot out. And once in their grasp, there's no escape. But how do these tentacles and arms work in a giant squid? I mean, obviously muscles are involved, but they don't act on bones like they do in our bodies. Because that's what I can't get my head around at the moment, is that it just doesn't look like muscle that right. I'm familiar if with. If you think about a tongue, for example, a tongue doesn't have any bones in it either, but you can protrude a tongue and pull a tongue into a curl and raise it, and all of that's done with muscle fibers that are traveling in different directions. What happens if we cut through? I'm desperate to cut through one of these and actually just see cross-section of what, what we see. What have we got right there to begin with? We definitely have a nerve running right in the middle here. Yeah. By cutting a thin slice, we want to try to work out how the muscle fibers squeeze. So maybe if you bring the die over, we can maybe highlight a little bit of this. You just get ready with your old fingers. Okay. And I'll just give it a bit of a run down there and smear it around. Well, it's definitely showing things up better, oh, yeah. isn't it? Okay, so it looks like there's some fibers that are radiating in this direction. Mm. And then in this direction, you see them like that. And in fact, there's a, a whole ring going around the perimeter of this. But what are these muscles acting on? It seems they squeeze the fluid inside, much like hydraulic fluid in car brakes. So these muscles must be contracting the sides. Mm. If you imagine that one of these fingers was like one of those tentacles and we were to push on it, you would end up pushing more and more of the stuff forward. And if we were to keep going, if you put your hand after mine yeah. well. in sequence, now, if this were even stretchier, it would just keep on going, keep on extending further out. But all of the muscles that are just inside of that, are surrounding the nerve, they're probably running 
this direction, so they would end up pulling everything back again. Yep. Steve thinks the giant squid may act differently to smaller squid. His hunch is that the giant relies on stealth rather than speed to hunt in deep water. Actually, can we just see if we can move this body just slightly further, further back and then just lay this out as if it was in the water? So the sea surface would be over there somewhere by how many hundreds of metres? About 500. So 500 metres that way you've got sea surface. Then you've got this guy, vertical, essentially, with its mantle up top. Pointy. Yep. Pointing right at the top. And then you've got the tentacles dangling below into the water column and these would all be z as you say zipped up essentially your entire length all the way down here and then you've got your eyes all the way up here now that eye it's like it's on an axle it's got two of them and that would sight up along those arms like rifle sights and it can see all the way in the distance if you want to pull up or hold up one of the tentacle clubs down there or hold them both up now eyes are sighting up here down the arms all the way down there to those brilliant white clubs and those two clubs open like that and it's just chasing like two anacondas zipped up it's looking searching for prey and then once it grabs it bang there's no escape there's no okay stop. so another squid lunch comes along touches the end of these are these so sensitive that as soon as they get touched by anything they'll just go around the, the animal here and these suckers can then can we feel it? Can they actually st still stick to anything? You, if you take it, you they probably are. That's yeah. Look at that. You have still got. And each one of those has also got that circular saw like ring all around it. That's just going to latch onto the soft-bodied squid. There's just no escape. And then the whole body then comes. Should we do it? Yep. Down we go, and the arms will splay, like and it'll <laughs> come over. Got you. <laughs> got me. And those will open up and they'll restrain the squid. Then that's just all pulled towards the business end. The business right end there. into the beak, dispatched. Done. That's amazing. I just love to be there in the sub, just hovering around in the darkness and to actually see these two tentacles just hover on down. But what you're describing, you're saying, it, wouldn't it be nice to, to be in a sub seeing this stuff? I'm getting the impression nobody has actually seen this happening for real. This is all speculation, complete speculation. Giant squids are deeply mysterious animals. They have three hearts, they have blue blood. Their skin has the ability to change color, not just change color slowly like a chameleon, but change color rapidly. So it's almost as though they're running film, skin flicks, over the surface of the body. It's such an odd creature. Where does this thing come from? Well, this is one member of the phylum mollusca. And those are the likes of octopus and snails and, uh, you know, your clams. A bit of a, bit of a difference there, though. Octopus, oh. snail, related. I, I know where you Snails, come from. clams, yeah. they have shells. They have, yes, they it has do. no shell. I'm sure somewhere around here we have their next of kin because these are more closely related to this animal here than they are with this animal here is to something like an elephant or a giraffe. This is an invertebrate, this is an invertebrate. This has got an external shell. This has got a shell, but it's stuck up deep inside the mantle. This here is a head foot, okay? So you've basically got the head, which is now withdrawn. And the foot here, this is actually the foot of the squid. All that's happened is I've just drawn that foot out into eight different appendages. The head, that's positioned right here. If I were to take the shell off, this is all soft-bodied inside. It's just an invertebrate. And then stretch out that coil, what we've got is a long body. Yeah. which is in fact the name of this group of animals, right? Foot, Cephalopod, head, yeah. head foot. Until recently, the giant squid was thought to be the largest member of the cephalopod family, but it's not. In the Ross Sea off Antarctica in 2007, 
fishermen brought in a giant toothfish with a huge chunk missing. It was covered in large serrated sucker marks. What a nasty way to go. A few hooks further down the line, they discovered the red monster responsible. He's got a huge body. This species is what Steve O'Shea named the colossal squid. We're going to need the crane, guys. Previously, only fragments of this animal had been found. This is an extremely rare preserved specimen of the colossal squid's deadly hooked limbs. The remarkable thing about the colossal squid is that it's got a combination of both suckers and hooks on the arms. These suckers probably function in much the same way as the suckers on the giant squid. The hooks are simply there to restrain a two meter long fish. This is taking down one foot long squid, so it doesn't need this sort of arsenal to restrain uh, the, the struggling prey before it's dispatched with the beak. Will these prey on those? Uh, these live in the Antarctic and these are subtropical to subantarctic. They do extend into the tropics as well, but the two of them would probably never, ever meet. To help understand how these animals live, Joy's off to Vancouver Island to swim with their most famous close relative, the octopus. Unlike the giant squid, the giant Pacific octopus lives in water shallow enough for scuba diving. Joy wants to come face to face with one in its natural habitat. Local divers take her to an octopus's den. She tries to tempt it out with a crab. It's just amazing to watch it swimming. It would just sort of pump its body like this and then take off. And then it was crawling all over me. It was really kind of disconcerting at first because you couldn't see anything. It was just all over your face, and all over my mask, and I couldn't see anything at all except suckers everywhere. Those muscles were incredibly powerful when it wanted to be, and then it was very gentle. So it really alternated between having very powerful arms and then very gelatinous, soft arms. Very unlike anything you'd ever see on land. The action of the arms was, was paradoxical. I thought it was going to creep along the bottom, kind of like a caterpillar or, or even a snake. But instead, the arms rolled, almost like wheels. It was pretty gentle with me, and I loved every second of it. We want to find out if the giant squid can perform similar tricks with its skin. Unfortunately, much of the outer skin was destroyed when it was caught, but there are still some small red sections remaining. Guys, do you want to... I've got a digital microscope here, a little toy. Do we want to oh, see if that, That's great. So just, Steve, just talk us through, what, what are these black specks that we're seeing here on the microscope? What you're looking at there are the chromatophores, and each one of those, is, it's a sac that's controlled by muscles. And by opening and closing, or uh, contracting and uh, relaxing these muscles, it can increase or decrease the size of the sac, the pigment that you've got in there. Okay, but then it can change that? Just 
like that. Instantly? Instantly. We don't know how giant squid use their chromatophores, but we can get an idea with these smaller, freshly caught squid. They can create sophisticated patterns of colour. You can see in this one, it's spreading up and down the body. It even seems to respond to my touch. In spite of the fact that this squid died a few hours ago, these muscles are still clenching and relaxing. It's oddly beautiful, actually. is a dangerous place, where predators can quickly become prey. So to protect themselves, they use camouflage. This is where we do our, our animal no one knows more about this than Roger Hanlon. For his investigations at Woods Hole, he uses not squid or octopus, which are hard to keep, but the absolute master of skin flicks, the cuttlefish. Okay, pull the rug out from under him, right? Here we go. Oh, crikey, it's adapting already. Oh, that was beautiful. That was so cool. That was beautiful. They don't do it any better or faster than that. It's very masterful because they are perceiving many aspects of the visual background, color and texture and contrast, and they're figuring this out very quickly, and they're implementing that into the body that is regulating about 10 million chromatophores in the skin. And you see the result is very elegant. So the skin of this animal is like a high density display. We're yeah. talking 300 dots per square millimeter. It's incredible. So this is like a very high resolution computer display in the skin. From his research dives, Rogers collected many brilliant examples of camouflage. Not just changing colours, but also the very shape of their skin. And here you'll see the dynamics of we go from smooth skin to this great big mountain in the skin of papillae to create that three-dimensional texture. Now, just take a look at this. Now we can run the sequence in reverse and you can see the dynamics of what's going on. It's to do with not only overall good pattern match and color match, but even the three-dimensional texture match is very similar to the algae. So it's taken all these four critical parts and it's matched all of them for this wonderful camouflage. The giant squid needs to stay hidden from its eternal enemy, the sperm whale. This is the first time they've been filmed eating giant squid, surfacing minutes after a deep sea kill. Sperm whale eat giant squid using a jaw full of teeth. But I'm still trying to understand how this boneless animal eats. Obviously the start point is the beak here, which is just is an extraordinary piece of anatomy. And what is a big lump of jelly? You've got this hard beak like you find on a parrot. Mm, it's a pretty amazing thing. So I've got a squid that'll be absolutely restrained by all the arms, okay? Because it'll be thrashing around. And they're quite power powerful animal squid. And these beaks will then come on in whilst the uh, squid is restrained and actually carve it up into manageable pieces. Now, if you just run your, your, your finger through there, that is incredibly sharp, that cutting edge. It's not a robust beak in the, in the sense that it's not it particularly is. strong, but it's very sharp. It's perfectly suited for cutting up squid. All right, let's so. see if we can ratchet that open. The secret of the giant squid's oh. voracious eating lies hidden just inside its beak. Come along here. Should we just have a look at this radula first? Because that is pretty remarkable, isn't it? What's, what's a radula? It's like a file, and it's got many, many teeth on it. So it's got seven rows of teeth that are running down the ribbon. 
and many, many rows of teeth that run the length of the radula. So it's very much like a file and that just rasps the food up once it's been cut up into manageable pieces by the beak. So it's kind of like a tongue with teeth on it? It's exactly like a tongue with, a, uh, with teeth on it, yes. I'll bring the mic in really close and we should be able to have a listen. So the beak is cutting up squid into manageable pieces. And then the radula with these teeth is rasping it away. Are those teeth replaced? Because presumably they're going to wear down as well. They are. Uh, this is the used part of the radula here. It's like a conveyor belt and extending deep down in here we've got the growing edge of that. So as the animal breaks all these teeth, it just continues to give you new teeth, much like a shark would. Yeah, this beak is really weird. What really amazes me is that it's not attached to a skull. So there's no firm anchor for this beak. It's just sort of free floating around in this jelly. And if you just put your finger in there, theoretically, theoretically, and it's never going to work. Ah, look at that. It's popping out the jaw. But you're just disarticulating the beak. Trying. I'm uh, trying to do it without Whoa. breaking it. So, there uh, it goes. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's one of them. And. Here, of course, is the other. What if I hold uh, this part uh, down? Just like that, and they, so they just work in opposition. Yeah, look at this. That's stunning, isn't it? So they snap together like this. But while this part is very hard, these parts down here are really bendy. Very, very flexible. To really understand how this animal works, we need to cut through the mantle. Where are you going to... Okay. Well, I actually can't reach this yet. Oh, <laughs> hang on. I don't wish to be heightest, but do you need to, do you need, do you need to stand on something? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm vertically yeah. challenged. There you are. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, That's much better. Okay. So okay, so if you want to help yeah. lift that. Okay. So I've got to make sure I can cut through this and not cut any of the organs underneath. This is what you eat when you order calamari, but according to Steve, these giant squid rings have a disgusting ammonia taste. So we've got here these two, it's actually an immature female, remarkably, so those are okay, the... Okay, so it's female. It's female, yeah. But this is very immature. On a fully mature animal, those nidamental glands would have been enormous. So can we just unpeel the mantle now? You, you're about there, Joy? Yep, I'm all the way to the end now. Okay, wow, look at that. This is actually the uh, front surface of the body. And uh, what you've got here is a big cloak, which we call a mantle, which is just another word for cloak, which is wrapped around the, the, the animal completely. And the water is just freely circulating all through this structure here, right to the very tip. And I'm amazed at actually how thick this is. This is all muscle, That's right. right? So this is one like giant heart just pumping the water back and forth to make the locomotion. So this is how it's going to move. This is how it's going to squirt water out. It's, more, it's like a jet engine. It's been often compared to a jet engine. So everything goes through the funnel. So you've got this, this uh, cloak, the mantle. As it, expa as it expands, water presumably flows into it. That's right. And then as it contracts, it forces the water out through here. But in doing that, you've got a flow of water over the gills. So it's coming in through here, out through here. That's right. Whoa! <laughs> There's a lot of power in that squid. Now, if I can actually peek inside its bits, it's not going to be too happy about what I'm going to do now. Now, the mantle on these things is locked together with the, with the base of the funnel by two very strong don't you do that, <laughs> like two very strong cartilages. They're called funnel locking cartilages. Now, I can't actually tease those two apart until I do that, okay? Ooh. Now, you see that? That's called a T-shaped wow. funnel locking cartilage. Uh -huh. And on the inside of the mantle, I haven't damaged it at all. On the inside of the mantle, I've got an, a, a, an opposing structure which fits in there like a lock and key. What that does, if I were to do that, it'll lock up again in a few minutes. It'll lock up again. It, it just Every, did. It, it's locked up yeah, again. Yeah, look at that. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it did it all by itself. No, that locks the head and the mantle together. So when, when you see that huge uh, water gush coming out of the funnel, 
If you didn't have a good system like that to lock the two together, with such velocity, you'd end up leaving your head behind and your, your mantle would go off like that. Jet propulsion requires a lot of oxygen to power the giant squid's muscles. It breathes using gills. We take a closer look at these gills. What we could actually do is start doing some injection. We're going to put some dye into this and see if we can light up the, the pathway. By injecting ink into the blood vessels, we can trace the blood circulation. Now that's lovely, isn't it? It's beautiful. Whilst this is filling up with the ink, let's just talk about this circuit here. So we've got blood, which isn't red blood. It's blue blood in uh, cephalopods. It's uh, copper-based blood, and we call it hemocyanin. But it's only blue. And that's compared to ours, iron-based, which is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, yeah. A brilliant red. But in these things, it's only blue when it's oxygenated, and of course this animal is dead. And once the blood is no longer oxygenated, it goes completely transparent. So what we're probably looking at around here, apart from the zinc, is a lot of blood. Amazing structure, aren't they? Mm. Really. It's coming up beautifully down there if we track that on down. So delicate. And inside in here, if I cut on down a little bit further, and hopefully we're not going to be surprised by anything apart from the base of the ink sac there, and what, in all likelihood, that, yeah, and this structure here, I'm not sure, you know, but to me it looks very much like some sort of photophore, and it's a, it's a light emitting organ that we always find. And what, are you proposing these things might actually light up? It's a possibility, it's something that we do need to explore further. If you look at a squid from underneath, yeah. then it's fairly transparent. I mean, normally, if it was alive, it would be far more transparent than it is now. And all you would, what you would be able to see is where the ink sac was, it's because it's a very dark blob. So it makes sense to, on the underside of that to have a light organ that's actually going to produce some light going downwards that covers up the fact that you've got an ink sac there. So instead of using pigment, you're using light as camouflage. Right. To shield you from being silhouetted against the sky. That's right. And the purpose of this ink? Camouflage. So if, if it's attacked by something, it shoots out a, a large amount of ink. It's a smoke screen. Yeah, smoke screen. Actually, we don't know with the giant squid, though, is exactly how they use it in, in octopus and another shallower cephalopod. The octopuses will either produce a, a small bolus of ink, which kind of distracts the predator, and it, it, it sticks in the water. It's full of mucus also. It stays and hangs in the water and looks like that's where the octopus is, but meanwhile it's jetted in the opposite direction. And another, another thing that they would do is just pump out a lot of ink at the same time and form like a, a smoke screen. It totally blackens the water and it's impossible to see anything. But we, with these guys, we don't know. We don't know exactly how they do that. If camouflage fails, as in this battle with a moray eel, after squirting ink, the next survival tactic is a jet-propelled escape. To power this flight, they need to pump a lot of oxygen into the blood. Perhaps this is why squid have three hearts. This makes me nervous. I'm wondering whether that structure that we have there is the third heart. I'm surprised that that would be a heart. It doesn't even look like muscle. No, that is amazing. That's just, just like gloop. incredibly <laughs> thin walled. Joy's injecting ink to hunt for the three hearts, but even for the experts, finding them is proving difficult. Well, where are we going? It looks like there's a connection maybe right there. Can we break this? Oh, look, oh, look, 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 there's the connection. I just let it drain in from here, and it's now filled this. So this must be that chamber. The heart chamber. So that's actually, that's not the heart. That's, that's, that's still the vessel that's coming in. Vessel. Vessel. And that there is the heart. Oh, okay. So that's the heart pumping that, yep. pumping into here. And this is the heart pumping into this sac that's right over here. Okay, so we've got here, this is the central systemic heart, the big one, if you like. That's the pumping blood out to the whole of the body. The body's taking oxygen out of the blood, carbon dioxide's going back into the blood, it's then coming back to the branchial heart. So that pumps it through the gills, 
where the carbon dioxide goes out into the water. Oxygen's picked up from the water into that blood, which then comes back and then drains through these big vessels back to the systemic heart, so it can then pump oxygen-rich blood back out to the body. You've nailed it. Beautiful. In the middle of our dissection, an incredibly rare cephalopod specimen arrived from a deep ocean research ship that had docked a few hours before. This is true. We'll have a look at this. This is truly phenomenal. That, you thought, was alien. Now, this is truly alien. This was described in 1885 and is known from one specimen only. Wow. It's a thing called Ceratuthus magna. It is truly remarkable. Let's see, how will we get that off, Ian? So we'll just line that off like that. Now this is what you call a serrate octopus. And they're incredibly deep sea animals. This has come from a depth of about 1800 odd meters. And what we could do to confirm that ID, we're just gonna make a slight dorsal incision in here. And this has got a very well developed shell or a gladius inside as well. It's a bit horseshoe shaped, so I'll just... So a shell, but not, not a shell like a snail shell. It's very similar, but it's not coiled. It's the only difference. So we'll just gently go through here. It's still ever so slightly frozen. Now we're almost there. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. So we're just going to pull this structure out. That is Ceratuthus magna, specimen number two from the southern hemisphere. Okay, that's how rare that is. This vestigial shell links back to something we do know about the giant squid. Where it came from. Five hundred million years ago, from a primitive mollusk ancestor that would have looked a lot like this limpet, a new form of animal life started to take shape the cephalopod. Their shells had compartments which they could fill full of gas, allowing them to float above the seabed into the water above. With this revolutionary adaptation, the cephalopods exploded across the seas. For hundreds of millions of years, cephalopods dominated the fossil record. Aminoids like this, sometimes their shells could grow to over two meters across. But the Earth changes constantly. With each major crisis or mass extinction, the cephalopods which had lost their buoyant outer shells bounced back. The aminoids did not. And the last of them went extinct along with the dinosaurs. No one knows exactly why. But there is one cephalopod with a chambered shell which has somehow survived almost unchanged for half a billion years, the Nautilus. To look at this now is to imagine a world before mammals, birds, trees even, before there were fish in the oceans. It's as if you're looking back at the very dawn of all animal life. From shallow water beginnings, the cephalopods spread into the deep sea. these depths, through the twilight zone and beyond, extreme pressures and freezing temperatures cause life to become very strange indeed. Each bizarre adaptation gives a new survival advantage. One of the most important is being able to see and be seen in the dark. The sea seems like a pretty dark place in a night like tonight. The darkness a few kilometers down, even during the day, is hard to imagine. Yet as we come to explore it, we've realized that the seas are in fact full of light. This light is coming from chemical reactions taking place from inside the bodies of creatures themselves. In this little tube here, I have the shells of some small crustaceans called Cypridina. 
If we crush these shells and add a little water, a chemical reaction occurs and they start to glow. Bioluminescence. This wavelength of light can't be picked up by our infrared cameras. If we switch over to a normal camera, then we can see the bioluminescence, but not my hand. It's most commonly blue in color, because this color of light travels much more efficiently through water. It's used for luring, for hunting, for recognizing members of your own species, and for finding a mate. But to see all these signals requires highly sensitive eyes. The mollusks are remarkable in many ways, and in particular, they have a very large number of different kinds of eyes, which have evolved independently. They have camera eyes like squids, they have pinhole camera eyes like nautilus, and possibly ammonites. Um, they have parabolic reflector eyes like the Jodrell Bank telescope in scallops. So they have a very wide range of eyes that have evolved independently. The giant squid is thought to have the most acute vision of any animal, because for eyes, size matters. So that would be how big their eye is? It would fit in this whole space like that? That's it. Wow. The eye would be deep in this or sticking out? It would be very much uh, lateral and shaped much like a, t a car tire. But what's popped out of that little aperture that you've got there is the lens. Actually, I can see it right here. Well, that's one half of it. Okay. One now, half of one it? One half of it. It's in, in two hemispheres with an outer and an inner, and they're slightly different sizes. And there's a sphincter running around the outside of that eye. That's constricting up against that lens. The lens. I'm yeah. looking to see if I can find any more of that. There. Is that? Yeah, oh, that's, that's the it. other half. That's the other okay. half of it. Okay, so there's two pieces here. I mean, to find a lens in, in a squid, a giant squid in particular, is pretty remarkable because they're very, very rare. So if we take these two halves of the lenses and put them together, put it up next to my eye. It's about the same size as my whole eye. And this is just the lens. My lens is tiny compared to this. So the whole eye on a squid must be a lot larger than this. I've got here the other eye this side, by the way. Let's just see if it's got the lens in there. How about if I hold this up? Yeah, that's help? useful. OK, we well, can see that actually there is the lens there, look. And you, oh, that's brilliant. You can actually see the two halves joined together here perfectly. See that? Oh, that is cool. The lens is still attached. Can yeah. you see Look that? that? Oh, that's a very fine memory. That's incredible. And it is fine. coming off that, that ring that we saw on the other side. Yeah. And it's just and dangling on by a th almost a thread now, the lens. Mm. I've done about 130 of these, and I have never seen that before. That's pretty remarkable. In fact, to even get a squid with two lenses in it is pretty remarkable. So it, this is in really good shape. It's, it's actually in very, very good shape, yeah. The squid eye and the vertebrate eye are really very similar. They've converged on the same pattern from very different starting points. There is an interesting and revealing difference. The squid eye is, you might say, well designed because the retina is the right way round with the light sensitive cells pointing towards the light and then the nerve cells connecting them to the brain coming off from behind in the way that a good engineer would have designed them and then going off to the brain that way. In the vertebrate eye, in our eye, the light-sensitive cells are pointing backwards and the nerve cells connecting them to the brain go over the surface of the retina and then dive through the retina in the so-called blind spot on their way to the brain. In spite of this, the vertebrate eye does work uh, very well. It's a good example in evolution of recovery from what might at first sight have looked like bad design. The squid's highly sensitive eyes are obviously critical to survival in the deep. But in the extreme dark, many animals use sound waves to detect approaching danger. Now, science is unlocking the mystery of whether or not squid can hear. They do not appear to have ears. But deep inside them, there are two tiny bones, hard to find of dissection. But using a CT scanner, we hope to track them down. 
This is a Humboldt squid, a notoriously aggressive animal prone to cannibalistic feeding frenzies. Hearing expert Darlene Ketten starts the scan to search for its ears. Well, the first question is really, um, can a squid hear? Yeah. And the results that we have so far suggest that yes, it does hear. One sense that's really surprising because people don't think of invertebrates as hearing. That's incredible. So can you see evidence of the ears on the scans? Yes. On these scans, things that are very dense become bright white. And this little dot right here is actually um, the statolith. That is the bony structures in the ear that are related to transducing parts of sound into neural impulses. It's tiny. Here's a pair of them. They're yeah, small, but tiny. they've got neurons coming right off them, and obviously part of their brain is working very hard to analyze those sounds, but exactly which sounds are they? So now we have to test the hearing range on the squid to see to what is it paying attention. Think he's out already? Yes, I think he's out already. That was quick. Researcher Aaron Mooney plays sound to anesthetized squid to find out what they can hear. So the basic setup here we have is obviously the squid, and the squid sitting in a net, and then below the squid is an underwater speaker. And that speaker um, is what we're going to play the sounds of the squid. And the squid's brain's response, or the ear's response to that, those sounds are what we're going to measure with these two sensors right here. Okay. All right, so this is the basic brain pattern of the squid um, at the top screen here. So this is when we're playing no sound. It's basically just a normal brain pattern. Okay. Uh, and then if we play a sound of the animal. Oh, wow. Okay, we're playing the sound. Yep, and you get a nice, clear response. So what we're going to see here is the brain's response. So what does this mean? This it just is, is hearing it. Yes, this means that basically he's hearing the sound. So the sound we're playing to him here is a, it's a low frequency tone. It's in the same frequency range as a lot of noises that are out there in the ocean already, such as reef sounds, waves breaking. Yeah. Um, basically means that he's detecting this frequency, so he can probably detect a lot of those natural sounds that are out there in the environment. Sound travels much further than light in the deep. This new research suggests that squid rely on hearing to give early warning of predators and prey. Okay, so what we'll do now is we're just going to open up the entire back of the animal so we can expose... Guts. Guts. Oh, nice. Well, from the beak, the esophagus comes... As we go deeper inside this animal, I'm amazed at the route food takes through this giant liquidizer. It's unlike anything I've seen before. Okay, so this tougher, whiter area, stomach, but this extension off here... That's where all the food is stored. We dart straight along to the intestine and out through the anus. So it's a very simple looped system. It's all we've got with a couple of sacks. And it's interesting that the end of it isn't at the end of the animal. It makes a U-turn, comes right back out, pretty close to where it started. But it's flushing out, if it's got its rectum here and its anal flaps, the waste product's coming out here at the point where it's jetting water out. So it's just flushing it all away anyway. So it's like a self-flushing... Toilet. It's almost a self-flushing <laughs> toilet. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just going to cut through one of the funnel retractors at this point in time. There's one critical part of the digestive system. It has to be handled with extreme care. I have just had these things, or too many of these things, explode on me. It's called the digestive gland. And it just splatters crap all over you. It's just absolutely <laughs> horrendous. Ooh, dear. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Voila. Okay, so what there. A beautiful. There we have one digestive gland. Mucky stuff. This extraordinarily squishy organ releases enzymes to digest and absorb food quickly. This allows giant squid to grow at an astonishing speed, from two millimeters to five meters in just three years. Yuck. Can you just hold that, pull that back in? Sure. Perhaps the most incredible feature of its digestion is that food passes right through its brain. Okay, so now we are exposing that right up into oh, the back. Beautiful. beautiful, look at that. 
Wow. That's the business end How of it. How pretty that is. Now this rather sad lump of tissue that we have here is the actual brain of a giant squid. You're looking at it right there. It's an, there's a number of, if you want to call them hemispheres, I call them lumps or what have you. <laughs> there are a number of lumps there, but as you can see, if we pull on either side of that, the esophagus is actually passing straight through that. I'll remove that, that might make it easier. The esophagus is going straight through the brain. The limpet-like ancestors of cephalopods were slow-moving vegetarians. Their brain was relatively simple and in the shape of a donut around the esophagus. They became carnivores and some lost their shell. Now faster, they needed a bigger brain to hunt and communicate. They developed huge optic lobes to process the signals from the eye and upgraded the nerves in the arms and body so that they could react more quickly. The arms could now control the detail of their actions without the brain. It's actually live octopus. If you cut the arms off, they'll continue reacting to the outside world. For some, this live dish is a gourmet thrill. Oh, it's stuck on my tongue. So is the octopus brain bigger than the squid brain? Well, relative terms, yeah, the brain is obviously much bigger. So an octopus would be smarter than a squid? Probably smarter than this one, I would think. <laughs> Octopuses can be trained to navigate mazes, open jars, and even seem to predict the results of the World Cup. So how does an invertebrate have such an advanced brain? Well, this is what interests me more. I've been standing around looking like a <laughs> spare part while they're doing the squid stuff. And uh, these are the animals that I'm more familiar with. Well, if you're going to make me look at the brain, I'm going to have to put <laughs> some goggles on. Okay. Right. In the right place, it's very... I can see it. We need some tissue. You're right onto it, Ian. So here is, here's the brain here, look. Ian, the, the so-called kind of intelligence of octopus, where, where's that centred in terms of its brain? Um, well, the intelligence, yes, I, the memory uh, part is at the top here. So the learning it does is mm. essentially processed and, and stored in there. That's right. What's also what I'd like to show you here, this is the optic lobe which is going into the eye. Oh, that's yeah, huge. Wow. That's, that's right. massive. Yeah. yeah, and here are the, you can see the optic nerves here entering the optic lobe here. All these little nerves here are going off to the eye. Oh, yeah. So you've got a kind of donut brain in the, in the middle which has got mm. the esophagus running through it and then these, right. these huge kind of optic lobes on either side mm. where, where the eyes are. That's right. And the, so the visual information gets processed in the optic lobes here and then comes through into here. That optic lobe is absolutely humongous compared to the size of the central part of the brain, isn't it? That's a very nice dissection, Ian. Oh, thank you very much. So that's the first one I've done in about 25 years, actually, of this kind, this particular. Ian, you never lose it. So why do squids and octopuses devote so much of their brain power to vision? And does it make them clever? In fact, I can illustrate this to you. Roger Hanlon thinks the answer lies in their natural behaviour, and he spent decades filming octopuses in the wild. One of the curious things about this animal is that it'll move along this kind of seascape and all the topography. It'll do long forays for an hour or two, but they can get up in the water column and make a beeline straight back to their den. Well, our divers can't even do that. They can't even remember where they've been, but the octopus is doing it. So let's follow that up a little bit. Here's another example of what the octopus does when it has to traverse the sand plane. And watch what it's doing. It's moving slowly on two of its eight arms, but it almost looks like a piece of tumbleweed or a piece of algae floating along the bottom. And you notice the motion in the back created by the ripple of the waves and the sunlight. These animals, the speed with which they move is generally similar to the speed of movement of the water play in the background. Well, how do they do that? 
Well, the amazing thing is that they're controlling it from the brain, from visual input. Look at the visual background, make an adjustment, be camouflaged. So to accomplish all this diverse behavior takes a large brain. So are they intelligent and are they, are they smart? These animals are extremely adaptable and, and that translates to smart in my opinion. Hard to measure that in human terms, but it's an unambiguous answer and it's yes, they are smart and they are adaptable. Any other major differences? Back in the dissection room, our final investigation is to find out how octopus and squid reproduce and to reveal the secrets of their particularly weird sex lives. What do you have here? This is a nice male. You can see this has a modified ending to the arm and the suckers actually stop at this point here. And then there's a, this, has a, uh, this organ here is modified for putting the sperm packets inside the female. This looks like there's a groove running right here. That's right. Well, this groove, in fact, this groove comes all the way from here. It comes all the way along inside here. It's difficult to tell them. You can just about make it out here. It's coming all the way up here. So that whole arm is basically a penis? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Only one arm does that, though. That's right? right. Just this one arm, yeah. So the spermatophores actually comes out, and it's passed along by peristaltic action, just like in you know, the way the intestine moves food along. In a similar way, the spermatophore, the packet of sperm, is going to be passed right down the arm through to here. To the end. And this is the business end. Mm -hmm. This is what, this is the bit that goes inside the female's mantle. Octopus sex is a rather distant affair. It needs to be. A love bite can turn into a meal if one decides to eat the other. So I'm just going to cut along the side of the median line here. So what are we seeing in there now? This is the penis. It's got a lovely pronounced so spiral just, at just the end. Just this thing here. Mm. That's right, yeah. This, this is like a bulb at this end. This is where the, the connection is here. Right here. There's a kind of okay. a bulb here. And then the, the uh, business end is here. So how do the spermatophores get from there down here? It's not entirely clear exactly what happens, but probably is it with, with the musculature that it has, it can actually reach the, in, within the funnel. Okay. Whether it actually comes out the other side or not, I don't know. I have actually seen that happen, mm. and then the funnel reaches on down mm. in between. Right, and the puts it on the, straight into that's the right, groove. Yeah. So yeah. There's a number of connections almost yeah. to get it into the groove. When the female's ready to move on, the male hangs in there. Females can mate with several males before choosing which sperm packet she'll introduce to her eggs. Eventually, she retreats to a safe haven to look after the fertilised eggs. The giant squid's reproduction is even more intriguing. Eggs are extruded directly out into the mantle cavity. Thousands and thousands of these things. And in the mature animal, this then secretes a phenomenal amount of jelly. These eggs and this jelly are all bound together within this mantle. And she's sitting there, and she's doing this. She's, she's like a cement mixer, you know, and she's binding all of this jelly and this egg mass up together. Then, of course, this is all closed over, and she contracts her mantle and squeezes this gelatinous egg mass out through the, the funnel there. And it comes out as this ball. As she gets her arms, she grabs that, and she cradles it in her arms. So you, you've got a jelly ball of eggs just down here. What's the male side of reproduction? Well, he's got this enormous penis. Okay, it's about a metre, a metre and a half in length. And what he's actually so doing... So if this was a male, so forget the female stuff, where would the penis be? It would run from... Uh, about here to about here, actually protrudes freely from the mantle cavity. And the male and the female, they come together beak to beak. And with this penis, he physically stabs her in the arm and it's injected under pressure. It's like a hypodermic. Inserts. So, so the sperm are injected into the muscle of her arms? Yep, directly into and deep. And 
we've actually got some. Now, these are some preserved ones from an obviously mated female. And you'll see just how long these packages of sperm are. Now, this is not one sperm, obviously, but that is many, many, many sperm tied up in that. And that is physically, under pressure, inserted directly by the penis into the arms. Now, are all the sperm that fertilize those eggs from the same male, or can she be carrying around sperm from lots of different males in her arms and have egg masses with lots of different fathers? It does happen with other squids, though. We do know this. So the babies will have different fathers. For that to be happening, though, you'd have to have lots and lots and lots of them come together, you know, for spawning. And then she releases that egg mass. She's cradling it in the arms, and the jelly from the nidimental glands with all the chemicals in it, that causes these things to basically come alive they migrate to the surface of the arms, the heads of these explode, and they release all of the individual sperm in the end directly to the face of the egg. Makes human reproduction seem a bit simple, really, isn't it? Very tender in comparison to squid sex. Yeah, it's pretty full on, isn't it? Mm. And then she just releases that egg mass, and it absorbs water, and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it could well be three, four metres in diameter. Wow. About three weeks later, they hatch, and that's the end of the life cycle. That's incredible, absolutely incredible. Recently, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute sent an ROV over 2,000 metres below the waves. This is what they saw. In the total darkness, they found a mother squid of a different species, cradling an egg mass of 3,000 embryos. And so once she's then um, got her fertilised egg ball, she's released it, it's gone, is that her life's work over? She's dead. She just sinks to the bottom and then she's probably picked up or scavenged by other fish and other squid and possibly sperm whales as well. And the food chain continues. This is the final act in a truly alien life story. The science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke, who obviously loved writing about uh, space fiction, also made the point that we know less about the deep sea than we know about the moon. We can't, unfortunately, go to distant planets to see what alien life might be. So maybe the deep sea is the next best thing. Who knows what else we may find down there? <laughs>